All right, let's get the lowdown on dirt. This is a blog article. If you follow my screen, this is available at cbagenetics.com, the lowdown on dirt. And I find this just by going to Google and typing in Ross Truth Emerald Soil, and you should be able to pull it up as the first article. And so I wanted to go over this with you, um, mainly because when I was at the Emerald Cup, I noticed that a lot of the top growers whose flowers I really liked um, that were grown organically, they came to a lot of the same conclusions that build a soil came to, even if we hadn't talked together before. And we may use slightly different language for that, but I've noticed most of the people at the top of their game growing the best quality flowers that I've seen. They follow some very basic principles for their soil building, as well as maybe some of their supplemental. And then um, on top of that, a few years ago, I got the Long Valley Royal Kush, um, and that was when uh, Ross Truth passed away. And the Long Valley Royal 8 was named the Mandel Brat, which is Ross Truth's nickname. And, um, you know, I'm, I may not be getting all of this right, but that is my first experience um, with his genetics. And so I had a really good run with those. I also worked with Rootwise, who really likes the Long Valley line, and he gave me some of his selection from the Long Valley 7, and it was phenomenal. And so now I'm connecting back to this 10 years of work on the Long Valley Royal Kush and a breeder who did it organically and talks about it. And when you look in this article, he talks about his soil building process. And so I wanted to make some comparison notes on how we do ours. And like I mentioned, talking to other growers, we found other similarities. So what I wanted to do with this is just read you this article. And I know you can read it on your own, but I figured if I read it to you, we're going to be able to stop together and I'm going to go over some of the similarities that I notice and we'll talk about a few of the points. So hopefully this doesn't take me too long, but I found a connection here because um, similarly to me, he saw that organics didn't really have a, um, an easy way to go for the customer as far as obtaining this knowledge or getting the actual products to use. And so this article was written to help people consider organics. And that's really what Build a Soil is about. So let me just jump right in. Uh, we'll start at the top right here, the nitty gritty on what hydroponics industry. Okay, so the nitty gritty on what the hydroponics industry doesn't want you to know about organic soil grown kind bud. I guarantee the stoniest, most medicinal, best tasting, smoothest smoking, cleanest burning herb you've ever smoked was organically grown in soil. If you haven't ever had the opportunity to smoke organic soil grown kind bud, now is your chance. Stop by Build a Soil. Um, we've got all the materials here. And then if you live in an area where it's more challenging to find these products, um, that's what our website's for. Now, he lives in California. And if you guys are lucky enough to be in an area like Cali, where there's a lot of different access to um, soil inputs, the other challenge you're going to have is sorting through all of the bullshit that's out there. So you can email us for questions. We're always happy to help, even if the products don't come from Build a Soil. Um, let's just keep going. So now I'm here. In an industry dominated by sales reps, greed mongers, and propaganda pushing profiteers, it can be hard to figure out which medium to grow in and what nutrients or products to use. Many of the products on the market today are designed with fancy labels and special formulas or recipes targeting the novice or a hobby grower. Often many of the products are overpriced, they're diluted, they have little or no effect on the plants you're growing. And many of the products manufactured for the hydroponics industry in North America and Europe are more than 90% water. So for years, the hydroponics companies have been our main sponsors of all the publication of cannabis cultivation guides. Each year since the late 80s, the newest literature on cultivating cannabis has become more and more inundated with propaganda from what I would like to call Big Hydro. So Big Hydro is the combination of all the major nutrient companies who, in order to sell more products, have taken control of the cannabis-related media stream. What better way for a nutrient company owner to make a bunch of money than to pay his buddy to recommend his product line in his grow bible? And so we're starting to see a lot more of this information come out, and we're starting to see a lot more um, uh, false scientific studies and all sorts of stuff to lend to advertising for these overpriced products. And one of the things... Um, I'm not reading right now, just talking out loud. But one of the things that um, Mandelbrot isn't here to see is uh, obviously California going legal this year and the inundation we're going to get of even more big hydro companies and then conglomeration therein. So a lot of you guys have heard about um, the Hawthorne Gardening Group and the potential connection to companies that may distribute Roundup and how some of the interests that we actually don't like are coming in in force and buying some of these organic companies. And so now it's up to you as a consumer to start to be educated about where your dollars are flowing so we're not supporting 
and actually building the opposition. So, um, anyways, he felt the same way, and I think he'd be rolling his grave right now if he saw a lot of the things that are happening, but I don't think he'd be surprised. And I don't know him at all, so if you do, if you had a relationship with him, um, this is just my interpretation. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, so where were we? Uh, right here. I am not completely opposed to hydroponics or aeroponics. They definitely have their time and place. A properly run hydroponic scene can be clean, neat, efficient, and productive. My biggest issue with hydroponics is pollution. You can imagine how many gallons per year are fed to waste right into our municipal sewer systems. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of solution filled with nitrates and phosphates flushed into our lakes, rivers, and oceans each year. What this does to our ecosystem is much worse than many people realize. As we become more conscious of our impact on the world around us, it is good to learn more sustainable practices practices in all aspects of our lives. I couldn't agree more. Look at, I've done hydro, I've done all the different styles, and I think that it can be done right and wrong no matter how you're looking at it. And there can be more sustainable adaptations. I'm also realizing that I preach growing indoors with lights and monocropping and stuff that's not really permaculture based, but I feel like no-till and organic soil is a step in the right direction for a lot of reasons. Another reason to consider is that these hydro stops uh, were to close tomorrow, if we had any major economic issues in our country, a lot of people have go bags and they're ready to go live off grid. But when you do that and you've got no hydro store, you've got to be able to make your own soil and understand the basic principles of gardening so that you can continue to have these results that you're after. So um, I feel the same way he does. The pollution is a big problem. Most people don't think about it uh, when they're using those nutrient bottles, but it, it all has to go somewhere. Uh, the beauty, here I'm at, starting to read again, the beauty of organic soil grown cannabis is that the only waste created is plant matter which can be composted, stems, shade leaves, etc. Soil that can be reused, recycled into flower or vegetable gardens, or donated to local community garden projects, and the packaging that the amendment soils and substrates came in. The more we are able to source our soils, substrates, and amendments in bulk, the more we are able to reduce our plastic footprint and grow more sustainable ganja. Um, I'll take a pause for a minute. Here at Build a Soil, we do a lot of this. Um, in the beginning, a lot of our stuff came in plastic bags, and it still does. But more and more, we're able to get our manufacturers to put them in bulk totes or bulk truckloads, and we're able to manage it here without wasting a lot of packaging. And then the other thing that happens with Build a Soil is we conglomerate. Now, you may have a local store that has a local product, but it may have been shipped in from around the world, and it may have been touched three or four times before it even got to your local hydro store, where at Build a Soil, we go right to the source, it comes right to one location on a full truckload, lowering the footprint, and then it goes in the mail truck that's already going down your street. And so um, it can be more sustainable, it can be less sustainable. We're definitely not perfect, but I've been reading some books by guys like the um, um, owner of Patagonia and talking about how you're never going to be 100% sustainable in your business, but making a step each day towards that direction can still have a huge impact. And so um, I think that's important. I'll keep reading. Think about the amount of plastic nutrient bottles that get thrown away each year. Imagine if you were to substantially decrease your ecological impact while substantially increasing the medicinal quality of your cannabis. This is the goal. And I love that that's a goal of his. A lot of our customers will come to us and they'll say, we are going to grow organic. We are going to be sustainable. Can you help us do better? And then I have some customers that say, hey, I'm willing to do hydro. I'm willing to do all the chemicals. I'm willing to do all organic. Uh, what's going to make me the most money on my spreadsheet? And so usually those people have more trouble than someone who's committed to the entire lifestyle. That's the goal, okay? All right, let's keep reading. Another point worth considering is the amount of water that you use per year on your ganja. Uh, water is the most precious natural resource that we the pe... Oh, I moved it. Let's see. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, where did I go? Another point. Okay, here we are. Many people in the world don't have enough clean water to live. <clears throat> However, in North America and Europe, we are fortunate to have abundant supplies of clean water. This does not mean that we should squander this precious resource unnecessarily. As we suffer from more and more nitrate and phosphate pollution, clean groundwater becomes more and more scarce. The more wells we drill and the more pumps that we pump, the more the underground aquifers that feed our fresh water springs and rivers are depleted. The more these aquifers are depleted, the more likely it is that in time our wells will produce less and less water. Eventually, the biggest challenge we could face as a people could be drought. Remember the words of Peter Tosh, Tell me, tell me, tell me, what you're going to do when your well runs dry? Is it better to think ahead? Organic soil-grown herb uses a considerable amount less water than herb-grown in bulk substrates or soilless media. When positively applied techniques, 
When positively applied, techniques are used. Similar yields of superior quality herb can be produced with less environmental impact and for less cost with healthy live organic soil than with bulk substrates, hydroponic mediums, or soilless mixes. The key is that you need to know how. And so that's where Build a Soil is hoping to come in and give you this information, show you what's possible so that you don't believe that salesman that says that you're going to triple your yields using their bottled nutrient product. Okay? Um, many growers don't understand the difference between soil, substrate, aggregate, soilless mix, and hydroponic medium. And this is where I'm going to start. This is why I'm reading the article. When I was growing up on the West Coast, learning to grow from the old timers, we weren't concerned with nutrient formulas. We focused on soil recipes. A good soil recipe, and the only thing you need to add is water and maybe a little soluble seaweed, molasses, and some guano during flower. We don't use guano, but I know that he did, and that stems from the past. I'll have a conversation about that in the future, but I still think this is great. So I may sound a bit, here's where I am. I may sound a bit archaic, but people have been growing cannabis organically in soil for long, longer than the English language has been spoken. It is the natural choice and works well when you understand what the plant needs and how to give it what it wants. So the difference between soil and substrates, aggregates, soilless mixes, and hydroponic mediums is quite simple. Soil is a living community of microbial organisms and organic matter. Substrates, aggregates, soilless mixes, and hydroponic media are inert, sterile, and not living. Build a Soil focuses on building these living soil mixes that he's talking about here. Okay, so soil contains nutrients made available to the plants by the beneficial microorganisms that live in the soil, where substrates, aggregates, soilless mixes, and hydroponic media require fertility to be added in solution, e.g. hydroponics. The difference is simple and distinct, and yet it is more complicated than it seems. Many bagged potting soils are actually bulk substrate and have little or no compost or humic matter in them. Sphagnum peat, hypnum peat, sedge peat, cocoa chips, cocoa pith, and redwood pith are all substrates that make up a large majority of potting soils. Although they have a good texture and water retaining capacity, they have little or no nutritive value. These substrates are often blended with bulk aggregates such as perlite, vermiculite, pumice stone, and lava rock to increase their aeration and porosity or drainage. Often, amendments are added to the potting soil to change its pH or texture or to increase its nutrient content. Rice holes, birds and bat guanos, worm castings, oyster shell flour, dolomite lime, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, fish meal, crab shell powder, granite dust, glacial rock dust, green sand, rock phosphate, colloidal phosphate, leonardite, and gypsum to name a few. A lot of growers believe that if they are using an amended bulk substrate, then the herb is soil grown. I beg to differ. Soil isn't soil without a substantial amount of humic matter or compost in the mix, and, and I concur with him. Um, and this is one of our challenges. We don't sterilize our compost as it comes in. And as we scale, we have to continually find the best compost. And that's why I think this whole message is so important, okay? Um, amended cocoa fiber blended with perlite, lava, rice holes, worm castings is still a soilless mix. To achieve good organic soil, you will need to have a minimum of 25% organic compost in your soil mixture. Um, I think, you know, 15 to 25 is probably going to make it more like a soil. What I mean by that is most soil out there in nature. Um, I, I agree with him. You have to have a lot of compost in your potting soil to really call it a soil mix. But in nature, we don't see 25% compost in, in the topsoil that's out there. Um, I feel like we probably see 5 to 10% organic matter. Um, and when you're gardening, a lot of the composts that are out there aren't quality enough to use at 25%. You have to use it between 10 and 15%. So be aware of the compost you're using and the percentages that would work in your soil recipe, okay? Um, and we'll talk more about that. So I'll start here now. Um, there are many ways to obtain uh, compost in humic soils. Composted sawdust and wood chips are often sold as forest compost, which is bullshit. In most nurseries, and they work well as long as they are thoroughly composted, preferably 20 years or more. <laughs> Not crazy? Um, forest compost is often mined from old mill sites. There are mountains of sawdust from the timber industry that eventually turn into dank, dark compost and will left to sit long enough. Most of the products you see are like six months old, though. Um, a lot of our composts are a couple years old. And so if you have access to some of these materials that are 20 years old or more, be aware of that, but you don't want a really fresh wood product, okay? Um, all right, I'm going to keep reading. So forest compost is often mined from old mill sites. There are mountains of sawdust from the timber industry that eventually turn into dank, dark compost when it's let sift long enough. It's important that all of the carbonic or carbonic matter is adequately decomposed or it will rob your soil of nitrogen. Alaskan humic soil can be purchased through most good nurseries and grow stores as well. It's mined similarly to peat but is much richer and gives a lot of rich organic humic matter to the soil mixture. I do not rep recommend using more than 10 to 15% humic soil in any soil mix. Another form of compost that can be acquired through any decent nursery is worm compost. Now, 
I'm looking at the Alaskan humic soil, but since this is written, um, Tim Wilson tested that Alaskan humic soil, the Alaskan magic. There's a lot of names for it. And, and mentioned that it is fairly similar to peat moss um, with just a little bit of extra humic texture to it. So this sounds familiar, but it is being brought in from Canada. I think that we've got some better local stuff. And so we'll talk about that. Our Oli Mountain uh, fish compost is probably a little bit better alternative for that. Anyways, another form of compost that can be acquired through any decent nursery is worm compost. Different from worm castings. Yes and no. I think vermicompost is the best term. Let's keep going. Um, worm compost consists of the bedding material that the worms are raised in. You can try to contact your local worm farmer and see what they have to offer. Uh, mushroom farms can also be a good resource. Mushroom compost has been used for its rich fertile properties in many a grower's soil recipe. It's important that you only source your mushroom compost from smaller organic farms. Commercial mushroom farms often treat their compost with specific fungicides to inhibit the growth of other mushrooms that compete with their commercial crop. Unfortunately, the use of these fungicides renders the compost useless to farmers and gardeners to reuse because the chemical fungicides inhibit the growth of the healthy fungi necessary for healthy soil biology. Always be extremely careful to do adequate research on the origin of your compost. One form of compost that I never recommend is green waste compost. Um, we actually use some green waste compost here. And like he said, you've got to know about the municipality. You've got to know about the research. And one of the ones we used here, we spent over $1,000 testing it and we have all the results for you. That's that Oldie Mountain compost. However, uh, I agree. We've also got pinto bean compost and, and dairy manure compost. And um, we have a lot of sources. The one thing in common is that we have to test them and vet all the compost we use because there are a lot of differences, just like he says here. All right. A lot of municipalities are composting their green waste. Stay away from any compost using this green waste. The last thing any medicinal cannabis patient needs is the residue from miracle Grow or Roundup that someone is spraying on their lawn or ornamental yard ending up at their ganja garden. I agree with that. Most of these municipalities are cities. They're collecting waste and trying to recycle waste, not really make a premium compost. Um, that might be different if you're in a rural area and you have um, you know, large acreage, acreage waste or forest waste, farming waste, and you know the sources of those inputs. So please use your best research, use common sense when you think about this. The other thing is that when composting is done right, it can really rip apart a lot of these problems um, that may have been going into the compost. The other thing we're realizing is that we can use biology to help um, uh, remediate and clean up some of the problem stuff that's out there. So while this, um, some of the municipality compost might be better just for like landscaping, um, if you do a great job, you might be able to find something that works in your garden. Okay, whether you're making your own compost, buying it in bags or in bulk, the most important thing you can understand is that the compost is the backbone of soil, and I agree with this. The higher the quality of the compost, the healthier the soil. The healthier the soil, the healthier the plant. The healthier the plant, the dank of the herb, period, point blank. <laughs> I love it. Um, learning about what makes good compost is the key to understanding how to grow truly superior quality ganja. And if you notice in our Build-A-Soil system, the two top rules we talk about is making your own compost. And then the second rule is making your own compost. So it's very important. We like making warm castings, but um, either way, compost should be high in, organ in humus and low in uncomposted organic matter. All humus is organic matter, but not all organic matter is humus. Raw organic matter consists of the waste products or remains of organisms that have not yet decomposed. Humus is one form of organic matter that has undergone some degree of decomposition. There is no hard and fast dividing line, but a continuum with fresh, undecomposed organic matter materials, manure, sawdust, corn stubble, kitchen waste, or insect bodies at one end and stable humus, <clears throat> which may be resist decomposition for hundreds of years at the other. Humus is dark brown, porous, spongy, and somewhat gummy, and has a pleasant earthy fragrance. Chemically, it's a mixture of complex compounds, some of which are plant residues that don't readily decompose, such as waxes and lignans. The rest are gums and starches synthesized by soil organisms, primarily bacteria and fungi as they consume organic debris. Humus is highly variable in its composition, depending on the nature of the original material and the conditions of its decomposition. Humus is actually more a generic term than a precise one. Its qualities will reflect different origins and composition. Just as wine can widely vary in quality, so can humus. And just as different wines are suitable for different culinary purposes, the varieties of humus serve varying soil functions. All right? Understanding soil tilth and learning how to create soil or build a soil with the perfect richness and texture is not something that you want to learn overnight. It can take time to learn how to blend a soil that has adequate drainage and appropriate water retention that is rich enough to feed the plants but won't burn the younger plants. 
balancing the amendments in such a fashion as to make all of the necessary nutrients available in the right proportions without under or overcompensating. I'm going to start off with a simple soil recipe and then expand on it conceptually so you can start to develop soil recipes of your own. This is great. Okay, so we've read the whole article. I've gone through all the key points. He likes to make a 15 gallon batch of soil so he can mix it perfectly by hand. That's two cubic feet. I'm going to break down his numbers so you can see the percentages that Build a Soil recommends, okay? First, let's add up the base, all right? This is the base and it's in parts. Let's call each part one gallon. That way you get to the 15. So let's see, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So he's making 15 gallons. There's 15 parts. If you were to do some, some numbers on here and actually break it down, you can see, let's start off with what Build a Soil does. We have three parts in ours. Okay, so five of his parts are the base, five of his parts are the aeration and drainage, and five of his parts are compost. Same as ours. One third of it, you want to be the texture. One third of it compost and one third of it aeration. Now, he might have a little more compost and some people might have a little bit different skew on that three part mix, but that's really the basic for getting the texture. And let me show you those parts. So, uh, one part cocoa, one part cocoa chip, one part Alaskan humic soil, and uh, two parts hypnum peat. That's the five parts to make up our one third of peat moss we normally use. He's using cocoa and peat in the humic soil to make up this texture of, a, of that bedding material, so to speak. And we don't like the cocoa core. There's a number of reasons for that. In fact, we're using um, a new product called pit moss to replace it, but in any case, one part of your mix needs to be peat or cocoa or pit moss. And so you can see one part of his is. The next part should be aeration. Let's count up five parts for his aeration. Um, okay, one part perlite, um, two parts rice holes, and two more parts lava or pumice. That's another five parts and that's aeration. So now we're, we're following the build a soil principle exactly. Okay, this is perfect. The next thing would be the compost. So let's see where that is. Uh, okay, let's see. Two part castings, three parts. Uh, so two parts casting and three parts of the dank humic compost. That's another five parts and that's all the compost. You could kind of call this humic soil compost or cocoa peat moss. That one kind of goes in the middle. So depending on how you count your math, um, he might have a little more compost than everything else. But this is the same principles we've been teaching. You know, you do however diverse you want to get. Here at Build a Soil, we use uh, rice holes, pumice, and now grow stone. So those three ingredients make up the one part that's the aeration. And so I think if, if you understood what I went through, you can see it's basically a, a three-part mix. One part is the cocoa and peat, one part is the compost, and another part is the aeration. All right, so without talking, without ever knowing him, we have very similar ideas. And that's because I learned from the same people he learned from, and I probably learned from him um, unbeknownst through the internet at the times I was reading all this. So this blend is what I'm using now for both indoor and all the nursery work that he's doing in the greenhouse. It has both adequate drainage, appropriate water retention, it's rich enough to promote healthy growth, won't, won't burn small clothes and seedlings. It's very important that you use a triple rinsed cocoa, part of why I don't use cocoa, but that's okay. And that guarantees a low EC. Salty cocoa can block potassium uptake and cause serious problems for your plants as they mature. I use both cocoa and peat in my recipe. Um, build a soil doesn't. We use just peat and now we're using pit moss. The sum of the total parts of the soil blend is 15. He uses a one gallon bucket to measure each part. He finds it's hard to hand tarp mix more than 15 gallons of soil at a time. So he also measures the amendments in proportion to 15 gallons of soil. And to each batch of soil, he adds the following amendments. I'm going to go over build a soils and his, okay? Build a soil adds one and a half cups per cubic foot. So in 15 gallons, we'd have six cups of total dry amendments. All right, looks like he's got about four cups of total dry amendments. Oh no, I'm sorry, we do one and a half. So we'd have three cups of total dry amendments and that is kelp, crustacean, and neem. It would be a cup of each to this 15 gallons because normally we do a half cup per cubic foot. Um, his amendments are these two. He's got four cups. So two cups kelp, two cups alfalfa. Uh, killer amendments. Kelp and alfalfa are probably one of the two most important. We started adding alfalfa in our new 3.0 recipe, but the idea that I wanted to show you is that he's got similar numbers. We add three cups, he adds four. I think you could be safe between three and six depending on the type of amendments that you add. Now, 
The rest are all minerals. Build a Soil has since done away with dolomite lime. We've learned a lot about the magnesium release. Every single compost we test has enough magnesium, which means that every single soil recipe when tested at the lab has more than enough magnesium, and adding dolomite is absolutely not recommended any longer. However, the way that he was using soil and probably moving it, not recycling it, no-tilling for as long as we are now hoping to, the dolomite may not have presented a problem. So I totally get that. Um, we use gypsum or oyster shell flour, okay? Glacial rock dust. We still use this, but now we're using basalt, and the whole industry is moving towards basalt rock dust, okay? Um, oyster shell flour. We still use that. Green sand. We don't, but some people do. Basically, there's too much potassium. All compost has way too much potassium, almost to a fault. So that's why we avoid that. Um, rock phosphate. I don't use anymore because of some of the heavy metals. However, uh, we use fish bone meal to get that phosphorus. And we're able to get heavy metal testing on that to know it's clean. So I hope that helps. Phosphate would be fine as long as you're not adding a ton of it all the time. A trace mineral additive. And so we use kelp, which he does. We also use basalt for trace minerals. And the trace mineral additive, which we also use during the growing cycle, um, I think I've got it around here, is the big six, which um, is just the six micronutrients that we found most often needed against our soil testing. Okay, he's got gypsum in here. And, and soft phosphate. So basically you can see that out of this, there is two, four, six, eight, ten cups of minerals and four cups of nutrients, and that's per two cubic feet. So per cubic foot, it's only a couple cups of nutrients and like five cups of minerals. Well, the build the soil recipe has been one and a half cups per cubic foot of nutrients and about four cups of rock dust. And that's because Clackamas Cute taught us that. And that's because when we started soil testing, we noticed that worked. Um, so the more testing data we get, we're going to be changing this a little, but realistically we have like, we're doing the same thing. It's really cool. That's why I wanted to create this blog article for you to see that what works are principles. They're not exact ingredients. It's like a chef can make a good meal anywhere in the country using slightly different ingredients. But at the end of the day, you have to know what the textures are and you have to know what to avoid because it may, may not be as clean as we'd want. Okay. Um, now I'm going to keep reading. Sometimes I'll ask, also add varying amounts of guanos to our, to our, my amended mix. We don't, but we have other ingredients that we use, okay? Um, specialty ingredients like neem cake, karanja cake, um, special ingredients like our pinto bean compost, things like that, okay? Um, but anyways, it depends on my intention. If I'm potting up young seedlings or clones, he'll leave out the guanos. If I'm potting up into three, five, seven, or 10 gallons, I'll add a few cups of guano to each 15 gallons of soil. Um, I won't get too far into this, but basically I don't use guano for a number of reasons, mainly because it, it, it is a really big problem, um, how they harvest it. Even the seabird, they need that guano for their nests. And I believe that bang for the buck, there's other products that work way better. We've got some amino acid products that will provide some of that high nitrogen. Um, we've got a phosphorus release product that'll help release that phosphorus that's in the soil. So we don't have to add all that guano. We can use a little fish bone meal. So um, as long as we know what conversation we're having, you can kind of follow these same guidelines. And heck, I know some of you use guano. That's totally fine. It's just not something we do at Build the Soil. All right. So because I live in the Emerald Triangle, all of the above components are readily available. Well, because you have Build the Soil, all of the components are readily available to you. Check out our website. We can help you answer your questions. All of our staff here are growers, and we can answer those questions for you. Um, you will have to look at your local nursery and garden supplier, go online to find certain products. All the organic amendments I use have been available commercially from regular nursery supply and garden stores since before hydro stores ever existed. Anywhere people grow roses, tomatoes, melons, corns, beans, or squash organically, you should have no trouble finding or ordering all of the bulk amendments I use in my mix. However, oftentimes they are sold in 50 pound increments. Although not very expensive, having 10 to 50 pounds amendments lying around can be a little cumbersome. Sometimes you can find these amendments in five pound boxes or in bulk so that you can purchase the amendments you need in the amount you want at any given point. We do that here at Build the Soil and we saw the same problem. It was very hard to buy a lot of these amendments. So we break them down in small bags. We put them in bulk. Uh, we really try and find the best. So keep that in mind, okay? Um, all right, where was I? All right, so perlite. Perlite, cocoa chips, and cocoa pith are available at most grow stores as are worm castings, Alaskan humus soil, and forest compost. Part of why we don't use any of these at Build the Soil. Perlite, um, it's mined obsidian. We'd rather use the pumice, the rice holes, and the grow stone. Cocoa chips, I talked about that. It's imported from overseas. I'd rather we use pit moss or the, our Canadian peat moss. 
Um, and then the worm castings, we have a very premium source. Most of the stuff at the hydro store is not good. Alaskan humic soil, um, we're investigating right now, but for a long time we've not used it because it's a little expensive import being brought in from Canada for really what it is. And forest compost um, oftentimes is not a very good product. So anyways, um, those may be what it's available local. And as long as you follow these recipes, you can have a great result. But if you look at build a soil and try and compare, a lot of times we can find you a better product. And maybe we even know of one near you based on our customers sharing that find with us. Okay, so ask us. Um, rice holes, lava, and pumice stone are used in nurseries worldwide and should be readily available at garden stores. And if not, we've got you. The hypnum peat is something I've been turned on to recently and working on bringing to the market. So far as I can tell, peat, hypnum peat is the best medium for growing beneficial bacteria and fungi um, for healthy soil. And it's even better than sedge peat. Well, sedge peat is like the worst out there. It's made from a salt, salt water based product. And that's really one of the main beddings for these worms um, that come from these cheap worm castings that are available at the hydro store. So take note, use premium Canadian sphagnum peat moss or talk to us about some of our other amendments. Um, okay, let's keep going. The most important thing to remember about soil is that it is alive. I agree. And healthy soils need all of the necessary organic components, components to support abundant and diverse life. When you add salt-based organic fertilizers or salt-based synthetic fertilizers to soil or soilless mediums, they toxify the ecosystem of the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the region of soil in, in the vicinity of the plant root in which the chemistry and microbiology is influenced by their growth, respiration, and nutrient exchange. So we're talking the two millimeters right around the root. Okay, when we grow organically in soil, we're focused on creating a healthy rhizosphere where the biology is the dominant force in the uptake of nutrients to the plant rather than a chemically dominant feeding program where the plants are forced to uptake salt-based nutrients to live. By feeding the biology of the soil, we get better uptake of the necessary nutrients for healthy and vigorous plant growth. There's a symbiosis between the beneficial bacteria and fungi and the roots of your plant. Plant roots themselves play an important role in soil ecology. The largest number of kinds of organisms are found in the uppermost layers of the soil, closest, closer to fresh sources of air, water, and food. True, some biological activity happens even at fairly deep levels, especially where earthworms and other animals burrow and where deep-rooted plants grow. Oops. Uh, however, in the area immediately surrounding plant roots, known as the rhizosphere, there are concentrations of 10 to as many as 100 times more organisms than can be found elsewhere in the soil. A soil such as that found under permanent grass sod, totally permeated by fibrous masses of roots, will inevitably have a healthier, more robust microbial population than one with cleanly cultivated row crops. I agree. Nature knows how to do that. No bare soil. Most of the important soil bi biological transformations take place in the rhizosphere, especially nitrogen fixation and mycorrhizal associations. The outer coating of the growing root tip, called the mucigel, is a fascinating substance, a product of both the root and the micro community around it. A gelatinous substance secreted by the root, the mucigel is a rich mass of microbes and chemical nutrients that connect the plant directly to the life of the soil. Okay. And that's why we talk about some of these biological products like Rootwise Microbe Complete. I really think that um, this is one of the best products out there. In fact, we're working with Emerald Mountain Legacy, uh, who's using this product and who's the brother of Ross Truth. And so this whole story comes full circle for us here at Build the Soil and part of why I wanted to talk about all of this stuff. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going. In my soil mix, the Alaskan humic soil and the dank humic compost make up one-fourth, 25% of the total combination of the soil. Another fourth of the mix comes from the peat and worm castings. 50% of the soil consists of dank, earthy, biological, rich, humic, laden, organic matter. So I, I calculated it at like 30 to 40%. He says 50 because he's counting that, um, the, the hypnum peat and all that stuff, okay? But you can see we already went through those numbers, very similar to what we talked about as far as the three parts. All right, um, so let's keep going. He talks about the math. You can kind of read that. The amount of rich humic compost, peat, and worm castings are in good proportion to the amount of cocoa, perlite, rice hulls, and pumice. This gives the soil the perfect texture and adequate drainage. The amendments are in the right proportions to one another so that all the secondary and tertiary micronutrients are available in necessary amounts. This is what makes the soil a complete soil. I will say, Take it a step further. If you're making a lot of soil, send it to the lab. Send it to Build a Soil. We'll help go over these numbers with you to make sure that a lot of our guessing wasn't inaccurate because there's inconsistencies between all these organic inputs. All right. The macronutrients can be adjusted by adding um, guanos or for us seed meals, a lot of um, premium organic inputs to manage that NPK and to suit the specific needs of each phase of growth. 
All right, you can also top dress, add it to the top of the soil, and water in during all phases of growth to increase desired levels of NPK. Some growers use blood meal and bone meal, feather meal and fish meal as top dresses, and they are high in NPK, while other growers are opposed to using any animal products. There is, is an emerging popularity in what has been dubbed veganics, that is using no animal products whatsoever. I don't agree with this. Nature doesn't do that, okay? But there are some merits a little bit to it, okay? Growers who want to grow plants without using any animal products use minerals and plant-based nutrients. These consist of enzyme-hydrolyzed soy, rock phosphate, potassium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, copper sulfate, iron sulfate, zinc sulfate, yucca, all these different things, okay? They're all products that are certified organic and be, can be used in place of animal products to increase the levels of nutrients. Um, he says, I'm a big fan of soluble seaweed powders and soluble humix derived from linardite. We learned a lot about that. Really, the seaweed was basically just potassium hydroxide, which we don't like, and the humix from linardite. Linardite is kind of an abused term. Not all coal is linardite, and not all linardite is coal. And so there's some definite things that you need to know about that. But you can ask Build a Soil, and we'll be, help. We'll be glad to help. All right, we're almost done here. Um, I'm going to keep going, and uh, I may have to break this into two videos, but let's keep going. The recipe I've given you in this article is complete standalone potting soil, and using it, you can grow a healthy plant through its entire cycle. It doesn't matter if you intend to grow the plant for six weeks or six months. This soil has all the necessary biology and micronutrients, and with the right additions of top dressing, will have a sufficient amount of nutrients for healthy organic growth. You can feed this soil mix nothing but pure water, and you'll achieve killer kind organic soil buds, just like build a soil. You can definitely do water only with a large volume of soil and get killer buds. Now, this is how I feel too. As anything else in life, there's always room for improvement. I want to stress the concept that less is more. And although we want to optimize growth throughout the life cycle of the plant, too much of a good thing can seriously damage yield, potency, and overall quality and terpene production. You can't just throw more fertilizer at it. At a certain point, you have to, you have, to have some specialties. You can't just throw more fertilizer, okay? So Big Hydro wants you to think that all you have to do is phosphate load your plants through flour and get good yields. However, most of the time, the truth is the exact opposite. Contrary to popular belief, healthy plant growth can be achieved without any, adding any soluble or liquid fertilizers to an amended mix. The main thing that I focus on isn't feeding the plant, but feeding the soil. Build the soil, feed the soil, okay? By feeding the fungi and bacteria in the soil, you help living symbiosis between the plant roots and microorganisms that live in a healthy soil to occur. This is what causes your plants to uptake the necessary nutrients that are already present in the soil in the plant's rhizosphere. Adding too many soluble nutrients often is the cause of poor yields, and overdosing your plants with chemical fertilizers not only kills off the beneficial fungi and bacteria, it will kill your plants. Okay? Something to consider when growing in organic soil is the size of the container that you're going to use in relation to the size of the plant. This is huge. It is important to give your plant an adequate amount of soil to achieve potential growth the plant is capable of. I recommend 3 gallons of soil per 1 to 2 ounces of dry manicure buds you intend to grow or 45 to 50 gallons of soil per one to two pounds of drive manicure buds you intend to grow. Um, I disagree with those numbers a little bit. Um, depending on the lights, whether it's outdoor or indoor, there's a lot of differences, okay? Um, to grow a five pound or larger plant, this is all outdoor, okay? I would suggest a 300 gallon or larger container. I totally agree with all these numbers for outdoor. Um, so if you're trying to hit a five pound plant, you need two, 300 gallons of soil or more, all right? The more soil you give your plants, the more you increase your potential yield. Other factors such as temperature, lighting, space, length of season, and weather will affect the plant's growth potential as well. A plant that gets all day, full sun, tons of water, and has upwards of 100 square feet of canopy space has a lot more potential to yield over 5 pounds than a plant with limited sun, partial shade, or limited water and space. Sometimes it's better to use smaller containers and less soil to grow more smaller plants. 100 half-pound plants might yield higher quality medicine than 25 two-pound plants. In the microclimate where I live, we have a coastal influence and plants that yield more than two to three pounds have a higher percentage of loss to mold than plants that yield three pounds or less. My neighbor had a bunch of five to seven pound plants last year and because of heavily, heavy early rains and warm weather for the two weeks to follow, he lost 90% of his crop to mold. I'd imagine the other 10 was probably crap too. Um, while my plants averaged between one and three pounds and I lost maybe 20% of my crop at most. My favorite plants were around 300 grams and didn't hold mold at all. Bigger buds don't necessarily mean better pot. In fact, it is often the other way around. Some of the best nugs I've ever grown have come from plants between a quarter and three quarters of a pound. If and when cannabis becomes accepted as the godsend that it is and the political oppression and persecution of the plant and all of the herbsmen and herbs women who grow it no longer tolerated by people of this world, 
when we no longer face the threat of incarceration for growing or possessing a medicinal herb given to us with all the other seed-bearing plants by the Most High Creator, then maybe we will grow as many plants as we should choose in the full sun in front of God and everyone. I don't feel like I need my local, state, or federal government's help to figure out how to grow my ganja in my backyard. Do you? All right. Coming to size and quality, using a lot of the microbiology products and using um, really good large amounts of soil, we've been able to create large plants with a lot of quality, especially here in Colorado. We don't have that same mold problem they do in California. And um, anyways, I just wanted to drop that in there. So the next question is, what do I use to feed the biology of my soil? The answer, complex carbohydrates, simple sugars, humic and fulvic acids, seaweed, and various protein. For optimal biological activity during the veg state of growth, your goal is to increase the fungal content of your soil. When you switch over to flower, the floral stage of growth, you want to increase the bacterial count of your soil. Isn't that funny, contrary to what most people say? Compost tea has become the popular way to increase soil biology. Many farms have invested in relatively expensive commercial compost tea brewers, and many growers are happier with the results. There's a lot of information on the internet about making brewers brewing tea. I personally prefer to use shelf-stable biological inoculants to rapidly increase the biology in my soil. I don't like liquid, like he mentioned. We found way better results using a professional dry supplement company. And so this is a this is the one I'd be looking at. This one, and then this one is as you go towards flowering, and these are the enzymes that feed them all. I know that if he was around, he'd be looking at these products. Um, his brother's using them right now. So, anyways. We're on the same page. I prefer the inoculants to brew compost teas because I know which species and which quantities I'm introducing the beneficial bacteria and fungi to my soil medium. I combine the inoculants with a substrate that helps activate the soil food web. This is the liquid one that helps activate the soil food web. Now, he was talking about a different product, but this is why I made this blog post. A lot of us are talking about the same thing. It's just that build a soil is trying to push it to the best quality and the best products that's out there. All right. Um, so the products, okay, helps activate the soil food web. The products I use for inoculants are available through um, commercial agricultural channels. A lot of these products aren't around anymore, so um, you can compare them by doing Google research and look at the RootWise products. Um, I think they're much better. Okay, compost tea has a lot of potential for variables and can actually be detrimental to the health of your rhizosphere. If you don't keep your brewer clean enough, it can become contaminated with anaerobic bacteria which is counterproductive to healthy soil. Whole batches of compost tea can go anaerobic and it always it's not always easy to tell. If you have a microscope, you've had some training in identifying the different microorganisms. You can put a drop of compost tea on a slide and see the balance of different organisms in the tea. This is years ago he was talking about this stuff. Pretty awesome. Um, if you aren't familiar with what a healthy tea looks like, I recommend a shelf-stable inoculant like Rootwise. If you don't have access to liquid inoculants or dry inoculants and aren't able to figure out compost tea brewing, don't worry, all the dank compost and soil and castings and stuff you put are totally good biology, you'll be fine. Get your own worm bin going, you'll be fine. But uh, if you have access to this stuff, they really work well. You can use any number of readily available organic sweeteners to help you find the feed the already prolific fungi and bacteria. His favorite food for the rhizosphere is yucca extract. It's available through organic agricultural suppliers. The brand name of yucca I use is Thermax 70. <laughs> That's the brand name that Build the Soil uses. And so we had this connection even though we never met. And this is an agricultural grade product. It's phenomenal. It's like molasses, although it's got a high sap in an amount, so it keeps everything moist and wet. There's great benefits to using this product. So I agree wholeheartedly. Thermex 70. We also carry organic molasses, um, sorghum, agave, rice syrup, dextrose, all work as well. Even corn syrup can be used if you don't have a farm supply or health food store nearby. I don't agree with corn syrup, but that's fun. It's important not to overapply simple sugars because they can ferment, create alcohol in your soil, which will kill beneficial bacteria. I recommend two to three milliliters per gallon of the yucca. That's the exact recommendation that Build a Soil came up with on our own without reading this and without um, knowing because the numbers on the Thermex are agricultural numbers. So two to three mils is what I use, okay? Um, 10 mils per gallon for water of 7% humic acid. Okay, we've got a fulvic acid and we've got a powdered humic acid that comes with our micronutrients. So we do the same thing, just a little different, okay? Um, all right, so as well as a regular application of a fish emulsion or a seaweed extract, all right? Um, we don't use fish emulsion. Emulsion is a chemical one. He meant fish hydrolysate, which is the fermented one. And we've got a freeze-dried version, which is significantly better and much more cost-effective. It's called Thrive-In. Check that product out. Incredible, okay? This also replaces the um, hydrolyzed soy protein that he was using. This fish one is significantly better in our opinion and more cost-effective, okay? 
Um, at this point, okay, you should understand the difference between a living soil and a bulk substrate. You should be able to see the difference between healthy biological uptakes of nutrients and force feeding your plants chemical salts. You uh, should be clear about the difference between hydroponics and organic soil growing. Now that we have a solid understanding of what it takes to grow ganja and organic soil with pure clean water and a little bit of extras, right? I'm going to take up the ante and take it to the next level. I believe it is necessary to create a healthy living organic soil to grow medicinal or connoisseur grade cannabis. You can have the best genetics in the world and they will never turn out five star herbs unless you have the true mastery of organic cultivation practices. I love it. The flavor and terpene production of chemically grown ganja just doesn't compete. And we can prove that if you look at our Instagram, we have unbelievable terpene and all of the numbers on this cannabis growing in organic soil. So once you've mastered the living soil technique and you've reinvented or replicated my soil recipe enough times that you have a thorough understanding of soil tilt and texture, and you know how to get the biology of your medium pumping by feeding microbes, then and only then are you ready to revisit the liquid nutrient tech propagized or propagandized by Big Hydro, okay? So to be quite honest, I want everyone who reads this article to know that I'm a firm believer in the use of liquid nutrients. Um, I'm not, but we have some biostimulants that actually fit the lines of what he was doing. And so it does make some sense to me, okay? Um, to get the kind of explosive growth that he's looking for, he uses 16 different organic liquids. We've narrowed that down significantly here at build a soil and still have a similar program, okay? So I know I said that my soil is a standalone, and it is. It doesn't need anything but pure water to achieve happy plants and dank buds. But to optimize growth and potential, maximize yields, I augment the complete organic soil with a liquid fertility program. And here at Build a Soil, we do the same thing. Go to our blog and check out our soil feeding schedule, and we go over using our products to supplement what's already a beautiful soil. You can certainly do water only. These things will help increase the yield and quality, okay? Here's the other stuff you use, humic acid. We use that in our big six. It's got humic acid, okay? Um, the calcium, right? Um, we've got some calcium sources that we use, but we recommend gypsum. It works really, really well. And we've also got um, a, a couple of other things, but it's really well built into our soil, okay? Magnesium, we definitely do not use. It's already too high in most soil with a lot of compost. Potassium is already off the chart in most of the compost. And so we've got a, a top dress kit that really helps release that. The other thing for people that are doing foliar, they've got um, some potassium foliars that work fairly well. Um, that come as part of the seaweed extracts, things like that, okay? The vegan nitrogen, all of these are uh, hydrolyzed soy protein, just at different rates. We don't like the soy. It's mostly GMO, and it's gotten worse since this article was written. We found the Thrive.N has a way better amino profile, and it's um, extremely effective in very low doses, and it has no sodium or very little. This is what we'd recommend. The micronutrients, we already mentioned. We have the big six micronutrients, Okay. Um, and then the micros, obviously we've got the micros covered. Soil Food Web Activator, we've got the Rootwise Biofoss, okay? And then the Poundit Foundation, Simbex, I'd have to look these up, but I remember that most of them were just kind of some, um, um, like a reiteration of the previous stuff, okay? All these products um, that he mentions are vegan, except for the Simbex, which is a whey protein, okay? Um, and so he goes through and kind of talks about all this stuff being organic. All right, look at our build as well products. They would replace a lot of those. You can do research online to find out what we're in these and what we might offer, all right? Um, all the liquid products you use are dripper and tea tape friendly. So this is dripper friendly too, um, and, and that's helpful. The biology that occurs naturally in a healthy soil can be added using liquid inoculants to any medium or these dry inoculants, right? Um, to any medium, including rock wool and hydrogen. The most important thing is that biology is able to contact with the roots of your plants. So even if you can't switch to soil, there's still hope for you. You can still switch to vegan organics. Yes, I, we're seeing a ton of people use these RootWise products in hydro and, and getting a lot turfier product, getting a benefit from the biology, but I think soil is the way to go, okay? Because these products are formulated for organic agriculture, the application rates on bottles are often read like something about a liter per acre. Some have a root drench suggestion, but none are specific to cannabis, hydroponics, or even for aggressive annual plant growth. Often the suggested use is geared towards spinach farmers growing in the fields. I've spent the past couple years working with this nutrient program and come up with a few good formulas. I'm going to give you the soilless formula that I use indoor sour diesel based on a 21-day veg period, 63-day bloom period, okay? Um, so you can go through and go off the deep end reading all this stuff, but realistically... What we found is that when something on a bottle like Thermex 70 gives you a per acre number, 
divide that by 807, and that'll give you a per yard number that you can then divide down to the cubic foot. And that'll help you get down to like the three mils as opposed to the gallon per acre or whatever the numbers were, okay? Um, and then instead of reading this schedule, we've got seven videos on our schedule using all of our products. And if you want to see that actual schedule, all you have to do is go to buildasoil.com and go to the blog post section. And when you get to the blog post, you can see the most recent blog is this soil feeding schedule explanation. I have seven videos on the feeding schedule, which of course you can do water only. But if you want to dig into this, check out our soil feeding schedule. Now, if it's not the first video, just go to the search bar and search for the soil feeding schedule explanation and it'll pop right up for you, okay? Last part of this article, there you have it. Emerald Mountain, organic soil, soilless veganics made simple. Now you have no excuse to grow chemical lab and beast your swag anymore. I dare anyone who thinks chemical grown herb is better to do a side-by-side -side test with their favorite strain and see which one comes out better. I'll help you do that. Contact me. If you're looking to switch, I want you to do a side-by-side. -side. If you're able to run a controlled, unbiased scientific experiment, I think you'll be happy the results from our methodology. If you run the fully amended organic soil blend with organic liquid fertigation, you will need to cut back the nutrient application rates by 30 to 50% from recommended soilless formula. Outdoors, the soilless formula will work with the amended soil as long as you're able to give the plants plenty of water between feedings. Okay, indoors, I also recommend plenty of water in between feedings. I like to feed water, water, feed water, water, chill. Okay, when I talk to like Lassen Farms and some of the other people at the Emerald Cup that have killer herb on scale, Instead of just guessing with these programs, they're actually doing soil testing now and they're developing these micronutrient feeds against the limiting factor for their soil test. So if you're curious about that, contact Build a Soil. We can help you maybe develop a feeding program for your large outdoor runs without actually having to buy bottled nutrients, stuff like that, okay? Um, anyway, anyways, the main thing to remain aware of is as long as you have a plant of healthy microorganisms living in the rhizosphere of your roots, the roots of the nutrient exchange that your plants need for optimal growth will naturally occur. The more you feed and activate the biology of the rhizosphere, the more your plants will be able to uptake necessary organic nutrition for healthy, vigorous growth. We like to put worms right in the container. This helps this uptake, and that's part of the build a soil system that takes it to that next level. With these concepts at your fingertips, you should be able to surpass any of your previous harvests in both quality and yield. Good luck, happy harvesting. Um, I just think that this is awesome. I know that took a while for me to go through. You can read this article a little bit slower whenever you have a chance, but um, this is the future of cannabis. Organic production is not turnkey, which means that you have to have these ideas conceptualized and internalized like a chef would. You can't just create a chef by giving them a recipe and saying, go to Walmart, buy the ingredients. A real chef that creates a, a legacy of a restaurant starts right there with the farm and learns how the ingredients are procured before they even get to the restaurant, before they get to the plate. And if this is something that you're passionate about, like it is here at Build the Soil, I think we're gonna really like working together. Please call us. Um, all of our staff is growers. You can email questions to support at buildasoil.com. And um, if you haven't checked out the genetics, check out Emerald Mountain Legacy. Otherwise, um, I hope this article was helpful and I'll see you on the other side.